Welcome back to the Artie Lang Show. My first guest, excited to have this guy here. He's as big as a sports agent gets. He's the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. He's got a new book out. Basically just called The Agent. My 40-year career making deals creative? and changing the game. <laughs> Lee Steinberg is here. Thanks, Lee. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I actually wanted it to be agent of change, right. but um, uh, I like that. But they thought for our audience that would be you know. <laughs> more to the. You know. <laughs> Believe me, I've I've written a couple of books. It's all about marketing. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. uh, so now, well, agent of change. Well, explain why you you wanted to be that. I mean, you're a revolutionary guy in this business. So explain that. My dad had two core values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family, and the second was to make a meaningful difference in the world. Right. And so... Two good things. <laughs> um, so then, after that, I went up to Berkeley and was student body president when Reagan was governor. Wow. So we used to... So you were very liberal and Reagan's governor. We And he... Every time he shut down one of our demonstrations, his ratings rose. <laughs> so one time we got in front of the uh, Board of Regents and he wanted to fire the president. I was defending him. And Reagan looks at me and he says, weren't you the same Mr. Steinberg that was sitting in front of troop trains in Oakland in 1960? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, Governor, I was... Um, about 10 then, and I was closer <laughs> to playing with toy trains instead of uh, troop trains. But that shows your usual adherence to accuracy and fact. <laughs> <laughs> boom, 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 boom. He walked right into a trap there. Yeah, and then, uh, but it, it later he gave me a presidential commendation, but that was years later. And right. so from there, um, I wanted to find something to do with my craft that, that, made a difference in the world. I was going to say, how do you go, you go from your father's amazing advice there to Berkeley and that kind of inspiration. How does that land you in the sports agent world? Because I was a dorm counselor in an undergraduate dorm working mm. my way through law school. And one of the students in the dorm was Steve Bartkowski. Oh, wow. And in 1975, he became the very first player picked in the first round of the draft. He was huge. So yeah. were you at Cal for undergrad and, and law school. Okay. So, um, so we got the largest rookie contract of all time. It eclipsed Joe Namath and O.J. Simpson. And we flew back to Atlanta to sign the contract. And we get there, and there are Klieg lights in the sky. A huge crowd is pressing up against the police line. And the first thing we hear is, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. <laughs> um, boom, boom, boom. I looked at him like Dorothy. Um, looked at Toto when they got to Munchkin Land, <laughs> and I said, you, we're not in Berkeley anymore. Yeah. But I saw the idol worship and veneration that athletes were held in across the country, and... They uh, interrupted The Tonight Show to tell the story. Absolutely. Yeah. This was Atlanta in 1975, mm -hmm. and they were football crazy. So I could see that athletes actually could trigger imitative behavior and serve as role models, so... I asked that the athletes go back to the high school community that helped shape them, set up a scholarship fund, put down roots at the collegiate level. Players like Troy Aikman and Eric Karros endowed full scholarships. Yep. And then at the pro level, uh, I challenged them to find something they'd like to tackle. So we put a foundation together that would have the leading political figures and um, corporate leaders, community leaders. Um, so, for example, work done. Uh, we set a program up called Homes for the Holidays, where he takes single women and makes a down payment. It has now done 131 houses, wow. and then it, we outfit it with uh, Home Depot. So this is the whole genesis of making sure that athletes are planning for a second career. Mm -hmm. They're in a perfect situation to meet. Look, the biggest fans of pro football are middle-aged uh, businessmen. Right. As a matter of fact, our business rests on the irrationality of middle-aged men. Because, <laughs> you know, if they paid $10,000 uh, for this piece of paper with something scribbled on it in their primary business, they'd have problems. So the athlete today, if you're a 49er, um, I had Steve Young and Brent Jones get right into Silicon Valley in the venture capital community. So Steve has already sold an internet company, <laughs> and Brett Jones has a couple billion dollar hedge fund. Or we wow. have we have three former uh, clients who were the first three um, minority owners of a piece of an actual team 
um, work done Atlanta, Duran Cherry, Jacksonville, and Ray Childress, Houston. So the model is to set someone up so that after their career, they can move in business, they can move in uh, media like Troy Aikman or Desmond Howard or um, Steve Young, um, and uh, they have a fulfilling life, and they still have their foundation. So you were doing this. You were, you were encouraging guys to go down and, and put down the roots at the high school, the college, and the, and the NFL level, reaching out to the community. This, you were doing this before any, any other agents were doing this sort of comprehensive, you know, planning, forward thinking, paying it forward, correct? Well, you know, John, when I started representing the athletes, um, there was no sports law. Um, I, I remember calling Mike Brown, um, and Mike Brown is nature's way of telling me I was too successful, so I just keep <laughs> getting players drafted by him. I had their first round draft pick in 87, 92, 94, 95, and 99. If I represented astronauts, Mike Brown would be the commissioner of the moon. <laughs> and, but anyway, back in that day, I called him up to talk about a player, and he said, we don't deal with agents, click. Wow. So um, it's been 40 years of watching this all evolve. Yeah, wow. so, I mean, what was great about what you just said, you take a guy like Deron Cherry, real talented guy, you know, if, if he's uh, playing in a different era, God knows what happens to some of these guys. Like, you, they don't have to die broke, is what you're saying. They don't have to go into some some low-level bowling alley they invest in Absolutely in St. Louis. They could be real businessmen. Jerron Cherry, um, through his Cherry Foundation, was granted the right to buy the Anheuser-Busch distributorship in right. Kansas City, which is a license to print money. Bruce Smith owns uh, a construction company and part of a luxury hotel in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, now, I profiled those athletes so it, right. to pick people who were ambitious and, and the rest of it. So it's not like a random sample, but that's what... You know, I mean, the other thing, the other real vision you had was seeing how powerful athletes are in our society, and they should be compensated for that. You know, a lot of these uh, insanely successful, like you say, businessmen... Uh, you know, th they could be ruthless guys in business, but maybe all they want to do is meet Joe Namath or something or, or, or know him, have a relationship with him, and, and Namath can be compensated for that. See, I saw the real battle in sports is not labor versus management, but the battle, say, for football against the NBA, Major League Baseball, Home Box Office, Walt Disney World, and every other form of discretionary entertainment spending. Right. So... The job of an agent is partly to be a steward. And I had the top players, like with the Jerry Jones or Bob Kraft, and I said, look, no more acrimonious uh, individual negotiations that just alienate fans and make players look greedy. Mm -hmm. No more collective bargaining agreements uh, that pit millionaires against billionaires. And one of the reasons pro football is so successful is we've had labor peace since 1987. So... All the energy. That's huge. Yeah. All the energy has gone into. Uh, can we do? Can we do direct TV with right. the season ticket? Can we do the NFL Network? Can we do fantasy uh, football? Um, can we do stadia that have all sorts of ancillary revenue streams? Can we do social media and on and on? So the pie gets extraordinarily large. Right. And. If I would go to a Cowboy game, I'd sit with Jerry Jones. If I'd go to a Niner game, the Bartolo or Jeffrey Lurie or Dan Snyder um, or Bob, you know, Bob Kraft, um, because they should be your biggest allies. Right. I mean, you'll fight over contract, but, but really, um, I wouldn't want to represent John <laughs> with a very tiny pie. I yeah. mean, the, right. you get a larger pie. And that's what we'll see um, here. Pro football is by two to one the most popular sport. It's an, well, as you just said, it's an unbelievable business. People like you have helped create. The NFL is extraordinary. And you said something, that we got to take a break, but I, before I just want to say, the, the great point you just made was millionaires fighting billionaires. Right. The regular guy who's a fan doesn't want to hear about that, and it makes it very unpopular amongst them when they hear millionaires fighting billionaires when they're just trying to get a good parking spot and see their team win. And to keep it that kind of... That labor piece since 87 is an enormous uh, uh, compliment to what you guys did there because that's, that, that's the whole thing. Um, 
the one thing I was not able to do is I would propose that a player would take less money to the extent a team with lower ticket prices. Right. Because I wanted to see 10,000 seats reserved for working people and young people for the future of the sport in a stadium. So by the end of the year, you have 100,000 people who are, you know, not paying uh, $2,500. And, and you got to think in the long run, and that's what you did. Uh, we got to take a break, but uh, when we come back, uh, we'll talk more with Lee Steinberg. The book is The Agent, and we're back after this. Welcome back to the Artie Lang Show. I'm sitting here with uh, legendary sports agent Lee Steinberg. His book is called The Agent. It's out now. Check it out. Uh, there's so many things I, I want to ask you about. You know, you always got top dollar for your guys. Uh, why are you such a beloved guy and a guy like Scott Boris people can't stand? What, what's the difference? I think you have a choice between either doing a more inside game mm -hmm. where uh, you, you do deals behind the scenes, you do them quietly, you allow the owner, uh, right. the prog if he's going to pay all that money, he announces he gets to do the rest of it. Um, there's no reason. See, when I'm in my other life, mm -hmm. um, I have opinions, I give speeches, I do all sorts of things. But in the athlete's life, right. um, uh, my role is to boost him up and make him look good. So, like reporting the size of a contract. Um, it sure doesn't help the athlete, it exactly. helps him up to ridicule. The team's furious. There's only one person in that equation that it helps. And um, how do you hide that, though, in this day and age? Is it possible? There's a difference between hiding it mm -hmm. and not boasting about it. OK. So the point is, if you rub that in an owner's face, um, then there's a circular. Uh, I mean, did A-Rod need to uh, did, did he need any leverage? Did he need publicity? Wasn't he the best player when he signed the uh, last You're Spanish right. It doesn't make player? any sense. Yeah. Right. And so I think A. Rod just wanted to be loved in New York, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's never come, never came to him before the steroids. You know, you make a great point. My ex-boss that I worked with for eight and a half years, Howard Stern, he always got these amazing contracts, but he never, he Howard never bragged about it. He never boasted about it. And the people always loved him, I think, because of that. They were happy a guy made good, but he never said, I'm the best, I got this, you know. And you're right. You can't hide it nowadays, but you can't brag about it either. No, and, and I remember uh, the USA Today used to do the total of most free agent signings. Right. And the players would, uh, agents would compete to be on that. And I'm like, we're not telling them anything. <laughs> First of all, I don't want to show that we have 90 players and uh, 78 who have been to the Pro Bowl. What's going to happen? The owners will say, this guy's too powerful. We want to knock him off. Right. And my players will say, how unique am I? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, now, that is an issue as a player. You know, you, yeah, now you, you want that personal attention. Exactly. Uh, you know, like Lee, I, I wasn't the kind of player that would be on Lee's radar. Well, but you said your guy worked with Lee, though. Yeah, my, uh, Steve Baker worked under you and I trained him with yeah for uh, I don't know several several years Good thing to have on your and resume. then went and did yeah and he was amazing and well, let me ask was, you that when you found that out did that would that push oh, you over the top was, of them, it right? was a big yeah right that's a big you know check in the the positive uh, yeah. column Here, here's the thing in business um, you can take the position that you if it's your business you can do everything better than everyone else right and the net result of that is you will do right. everything um if if, if you, <laughs> what you need to do is bring up younger people to be superstars and perceived that way by the world so that you've got the ability not to be a, a giant among pygmies but surrounded by you know the best and the brightest so so you can transfer business so you uh changing gears a little bit because this is a major part of your life you were said to be the the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire now how did that manifest itself how did that happen how does Cameron Crowe found out find out your story and make a movie about it so Cameron Crowe the director and screenwriter had done a movie called Fast Times at Ridgemont High right which I thought classic was, I thought <laughs> right. was hilarious yeah. when Spicoli knocks the sneaker and says, that's the sound of my skull. I'm so wasted. Anyway, so I loved it. And um, he asked if he could follow me around back in 1993 really? and, and be where I was so he could 
do a character that was. How did that come about? He just did research and found out you were sort of the guy to follow around. He was in Los Angeles, Uh, and and, um, so so we went to the draft here in 1993, where Bledsoe was the first pick. You know, and I'd say, "What's your greatest nightmare?" My greatest nightmare would be. Upstairs, Drew Bledsoe's father is changing his mind. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great, uh, yeah. Then we we went up to the press conference. We went to Pro scout, uh, Scouting Day at SC. I took him to a bunch of games. He came to our Super Bowl parties, um, and I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. And right. and, and he did this over a year and a half or Made so. Made a great movie. I mean, um, yeah. And then when it was done, I had to vet the script to make sure the willing suspension of disbelief that that keeps you in a movie. Yeah. It wasn't a lampoon. It wasn't all that. Then, um, how I, much of the film is actually based on truth? Would you say, actual occurrences? A, a great deal. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, a great deal of it. Where at least the colonel. Um, so. I took Cuba Gooding Jr. with me down to Phoenix to a Super Bowl and made him pretend he was a client to get oh, in, wow. in part the whole week. Um, I actually had to show Jerry O'Connell, the quarterback in the film, how to throw a spiral because <laughs> he had gone to NYU yeah. and they didn't have football. Um, <laughs> then they descended on my office and took all my pictures and on my body, Jerry Maguire's face appears. Right. and and shots out the window and the rest of it. And then um, I was on the uh, set a lot. So, oh, you see, um, yeah, that's cool. So that was an interesting experience. After that, I did Any Given Sunday. Oh, you were on that, too? With okay, Oliver yeah. Stone. Now, right. Oliver's a little different than Cameron <laughs> is. Yeah. But um, one of my jobs there was to put Al Pacino into role right. and... And then I had the really tough task of putting Cameron Diaz into the <laughs> That's cool. We, I want to talk to you a little bit more. we got to take another break. But uh, all that stuff is fascinating. It's great. Uh, hey, look, when Tom Cruise plays you in a movie, you've made it. You've done something right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Back after this. The Artie Lang Show. Weeknights on Audience. Only on DirecTV.